that's really what my coaching is all about. It's all about marrying peak performance and well-being rather than one uh, at the cost of the other. Because I've always had this sort of dual push between needing to succeed in life and needing that inner peace. Move over, baby boomers. It's time for Gen XYZ. It's time to stop waiting on the world to change. It's time to be the change. It's time to stop thinking about how your life can be better. It's time to start taking action, massive action to improve your life. Join Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios every week as we learn how others had the grit, determination, and conviction to 10x their lives, and as we explore ways that can help you 10x your life. Hey, and welcome to another episode of the 10x for Gen XYZ podcast. I'm Zach Winner. And I'm Mark Adair Rios. And today we're very happy to have as our guest, Georgina Halabi. She's a professional certified coach, and she has over 25 years of senior roles within business and marketing. And she currently helps professionals overcome self-doubt and step into their greatness, both professionally and personally. Georgina, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Hi, Georgina. Hi there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you. You've got such an interesting background, including you know, Buddhist philosophy study to the level of novice monk. I just thought that was so I love that so interesting. Um, so I'd love I'd love to kind of talk, start with talking about what your background is and diving into that. Sure. So I've I've always known that I've had a creative side, a very commercial side, and a very spiritual side, um, and I needed to marry both. So I went into marketing. I went into advertising. And um, in advertising, it's it's very sort of full on um, client servicing projects, spinning a hundred different plates in the air. Um, and this job took me, you know, from across uh, the UK to Asia. I lived in Singapore for eighteen years, working in quite a few big advertising agencies, and then for the last eight years, working in loyalty um, and marketing technology companies. So mm. I'd actually help businesses. Um, set foot into Asia and build their footprint there. So I was pretty much doing everything from uh, sales and new business to uh, client uh, growth, uh, operations, you know, I was wearing a lot of different hats. And um, it was really essential for me to be able to sort of manage all of that franticness and that hecticness with this sort of idea of spaciousness and inner peace and calm so that's really what my coaching is all about it's all about marrying peak performance and well-being rather than one uh, at the cost of the other because I've always had this sort of dual push between needing to succeed in life and needing that inner peace and that's what took me to sort of studying um buddhism to the level of novice monk um not just buddhism we we focused on asian spirituality so also there was a level of taoism and, and hinduism as well um and it, it was quite secular um so it it it, it was less uh, practicing but it was really about applied meditation and mindfulness and the philosophy and what i loved about buddhist practice is you know you'll be taught these principles but uh, the answer was, don't take my word for it. Get on the map, think it through, see how it resonates with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely loved that because it was fully encompassing. And it just allowed me a, um, a really nice way to walk through the world and see, see the world. But I've always had sort of a spiritual inclination, a spiritual mm -hmm. um, yearning that's taken me, you know, on many different paths uh, and many different avenues from everything from, let me see, learning about um self-hypnosis and the use of words to practicing NLP. I've been quite a, a, a fond NLP practitioner all of my life um, to um, hands-on healing and uh, eye reading. So I, I, I actually try to use both parts of my brain uh, wherever awesome. I can. Yeah, NLP awesome. stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming? Yes. So NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it was started by a neuroscientist and a computer technician who met at a university and they thought if you could map the brain and you could get it to work like a computer how would you uh, how would you run it so that it would achieve excellence so NLP is all about the art and science of excellence it's about modeling peak performance on for example top athletes mm -hmm. or on your own optimal behavior understanding how you've been at your peak performance state and what it takes to get you there and then being able to to break that down into key steps and to apply it into your life so that you can achieve excellence that's, yeah. 
does the linguistic part come into like how you use your language in describing like your actions or your beliefs or where does the linguistic component come in? 100%. So it's the recognition that words are really, really powerful. And often the words that we use can limit us or they can open us up. Um, so, for example, I did hypnobirthing with my two daughters and we used NLP as a strong component. So we weren't allowed to use words like pain. Pain was a big eh, eh. Instead, it was words like intensity or instead of contractions, it was surges. And we'd go in, for example, um, months beforehand and would work on all of the thoughts and the, the language that we'd use around the pregnancy and the birth. And we'd reframe them so that when it came to the time, we were fully relaxed and present and in the moment. Interesting. So yeah. you're using language to kind of really have a paradigm shift in your perspective of, of things. Yeah. What's that expression? Words are really powerful. Words become, um, no, what is it? Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become be behavior. And that becomes your destiny. Uh, I'm paraphrasing yeah. awkwardly, but words are really, really powerful. Yeah. There's a great recognition within that also that, you know, you, we, we can't get rid of kind of the self-talk. I, I know you know this from your Buddhist studies as well, um, that you can't get rid of the talk that goes on. And um, and so NLP seems to kind of recognize that and use it in order to um, change things. I love that. I've not really made that connection myself, but I love the way that you weave those two together, Mark. I think that's yeah. really, really beautiful. Um, yeah, and you're right. Our self-talk is often so damaging and, and most people don't actually sit and watch their thoughts yeah. and notice all the judgment, particularly about ourselves. I mean, the way we talk about ourselves, if anyone else talked to us like that, we'd punch them in the nose. Um, <laughs> but the way that we talk to ourselves tends to be so very damaging. And so part of that is reframing the way that we talk to ourselves. Uh, and, and using less violent communication towards ourselves and also others. Yeah. yeah. Did you do any Zen in any Zen meditation with, with, the, with the, one of the monks where they whack you in the back with a stick? <laughs> <laughs> no, my path, I'm, I'm fascinated with Zen because it's the yeah. it's the marriage of Buddhism and Taoism. Yeah. And so I really, really like it. But all of my teachers were Mahayana um, oh. Buddhist, Buddhist okay. monks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. No whacking. <laughs> <laughs> So when, if you're working with a busy professional and it, it seems like we're always connected and we've always got this device glued to our hands or we're staring at a computer and we're constantly looking for a new email or a new text message or social media. And I think, you know, meditation is more important now than ever to be able to step away and stop your mind from constantly churning and looking at like what they need to be doing now. But what do you advise your your clients in terms of like if they've never meditated before how to start the process and how much time to devote to sitting so i think there's a lot of um people have a lot of attitudes when it comes to meditation and that it has to be you have to be sitting and you have to sort of empty your mind i mean that's one way of doing it but if you've ever listened to a great piece of music and been transported or read a book or got carried away in music that's meditation. Mm. You know, meditation could be as simple as three deep breaths. But the yeah. idea is when you meditate, you're just stopping the narrative circuitry of your mind. You're stopping all of the self-talk and the analysis and the blah, blah, blah. Um, and so um, meditation can be achieved taking a walk in nature. Yeah. I I took myself off the grid for a, about a month this summer. It was amazing. <laughs> And I was just walking down the beach and I was in Australia, the Gold Coast, visiting my sister, just walking down the beach and just communing with myself and just being in nature. When we have nothing, we've got no phones, we've got no computers, we've got no excuse to just tap in and check what's on social. Then we have to sort of spend time with ourselves. And I think people don't do that anymore. They yeah. live in a state of unconsciousness because they're constantly having to do something else. Yeah. So when you get into nature and you're just, you know, appreciating that, that's also a state of meditation. So I, I would say to anybody who is worried that they can't, you probably already do it and you don't know. Right. I often think when I'm exercising that that's kind of a form of meditation because I'm focusing on the exercise and I'm not, my mind isn't spinning about what I need to do. Or if you can I'm do that, off. if yeah. you can, yeah, that's, that's definitely, I, I have that same experience. If, if you can do that and not let yourself 
do the exercise and then you start floating off into other stressful things while you're just, you know, just kind of putting in the reps, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, that's for me, that's why when I exercise, I really like to focus on what I'm doing because right. then I, I'm, in, I'm in the here and now I'm kind of present. Yeah. When, and I find I get a better workout when I do that too. I, I was going to ask you, Georgina, about that with, with, you know, let, let's call the word, let's call it flow, right? This has kind of come up with me in the conversation the last couple of weeks in regards to work. And actually it was, you know, another podcast, it was on Joe Rogan and funny enough, and um, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, crazy interview, but they were talking about working from home and the stresses that kind of happen when you're working from home and maybe your spouse might come in and interrupt a quote unquote flow that's going on. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if, if that's something that you kind of encourage trying to use your work as a meditative practice and get into the flow state, or if that's something that we want to kind of separate out from all of this um, that we're talking about here. Interesting question. I guess it depends what your objective is, because if you're in a state of real flow, it doesn't matter what you're doing. The, the thing that makes a difference is the presence that you have in the moment. Like you were saying, Zach, when you're working out, you could be completely in the moment of, of doing your reps. Whereas if you're working from home and your kids are walking in and out and you're feeling like you're neglecting your children, your work, your mind isn't on your work. Mm. You know, somehow when you're with your kids and your mind's at work, it's it's a function of presence. So flow is being so immersed in something that you lose track of all time. You're completely present within that moment. Interesting. And, right. and I wanted to just add something to what you were saying about um, reps and, and the physical aspect and how that helps us access flow, because I think this is really, really important. So when you look at yoga, yoga actually means uh, meditation. Mm. So we use our body as a vehicle to switch off our mind. And um, the way we're able to do that is our mind is all over the place. You know, when you you start to observe your thoughts, you're noticing that half your thoughts are in the future and all of the have to's and what ifs and the imaginings of something that hasn't happened yet. It's like fiction, or it's revisiting the past and replaying something, which isn't also a a faithful representation. It's also still fiction. Um, our, Our mind is very it's it's rarely present whereas our body only exists on one plane Mm. it only exists here and now and you'll know that if you're sort of really sprinting or you're doing exercise or you're in nature or you're absorbed with you know with a song you're hearing you're seeing you're feeling you're in your body and that's why it's so refreshing because you're switching off Mm -hmm. the talk all of the talk and the constant talk once you start to notice it it's like Oh my God, it's it's like white noise. It's static all the time. Yeah. That, that's why I think like in the flow, whether you're exercising or working and you're you're not focused on the mind constantly bouncing around, I think that's important. But I, I kind of feel it's also important to develop that recognition that your mind bounces around by sitting and meditating. Cause I don't know any other way where you truly come to the realization that your mind is like a it's like a pinball. Oh, it's it's constantly bananas. bouncing around. <laughs> It's bananas. Yeah. 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 It, you have to create space. You have yeah. to create space and silence and 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 start to look inwards and just watch. And yeah. when you do, it's like move over Netflix because the stuff, the parade of thoughts going through your head, it's quite illuminating. And then I don't know if you ever catch yourself sort of becoming conscious in the middle of a daydream. And you could yeah. be completely transported. You're somewhere else, you're someone else. And then when you wake up to that, you're like, oh my gosh, well, who am I really? You you start to question the self because you're so many different things across time. And we don't even know we're doing this. You know, it feels like the through line through all of it, even with when working too, because I'm, I'm in agreement. It's hard to describe flow. We know what it is when we're in it. We know that time, you know, there's a time kind of travel thing going on. We also know that sometimes when we're in flow, you know, we can be very efficient with what we're doing and get a lot of stuff done, right? There's a compression of a lot of things. But I also wonder, you know, because throughout what I've come to understand for myself in a lot of these things, yoga and meditation and things like that is, you know, coming, being able to use the breath as a tool to kind of center and focus has been critical. Right. Um, And, and some, you know, some meditations use a word, 
But if, if I were to use one thing that can carry over into all of these different things that's able to help me center, it's always been focusing on my breathing. And luckily I, can't, I come from the arts as well and, and I have a creative side. And I learned all of that very young, right? To, to learn how to find some way to relax. And um, I don't know, it, it's, it's very interesting. And so I'm wondering if that's something that you kind of notice and, and encourage in your, um, in your practice as well and teaching. Absolutely, absolutely. So for me, breath is connected to spirit. It's our way of noticing our frame of mind because when we are perturbed, you know, our breathing gets impacted with shallow breathing. Whereas when we're deeply relaxed or when we need to relax, <sighs> big sigh so first of all uh, our, our breath is a signpost but our breath is also portable it's with us all the time and it's constantly changing so it's interesting it's an interesting ob object uh, for our attention as we meditate so I find that whenever I use my breath to meditate um, it just tells me tons about the state of mind and it gives me messages also it just always reminds me what I need to do if I'm out of balance, in balance, it, it, it's always a guide for me. So breath to me is still that part of embodying yourself, like hearing or um, seeing or tasting or touching. Breath is just another facet of our body that we use as the object of our attention to get isn't, to that meditative state. Isn't one of the first kind of phrases in the Bible, right? In the beginning, wasn't it, was it, was it let there be light or in the beginning there was a word or something like that or yes breath? Uh, it interesting you say breath some people say it, it's om it's it's a vibration yes mm. god's breath right yes yeah it's a vibration and I, I find the more that i look into the various religions there are around the world the more that they're all same fingers pointing at sorry different fingers pointing at the same moon uh, interesting you know? yeah do, do you find um a lot of your clients kind of in that position where they're expected to perform at a real high kind of in the world caliber, like let's talk like to the level of like investment bankers or analysts, people like that real corporate types who, who have this kind of, um, I guess they have a, um, you know, a conflict within themselves in terms of if I do this too much, I'm not gonna perform as high as I were for the, for my masters, right. I'm not going to be able to be able to perform the way that they want. I hope I'm making sense, but I, I guess is, do you see some of that? And, and if you have, have you been able to make a bridge with some of these people to let them know that it's okay and that they've still been able to perform the same way, but still achieve some measure of mental, you know, positive mental health. So that's essentially you've summed up my job. I work with C-suite leaders, board uh, board directors who often feel like they have to, they're always on, mm -hmm. you know, peak performance, peak performance, peak performance, and often they burn out. Mm -hmm. And it's an idea of, you know, I have to be really successful at the expense of my well-being. Right. And some of these people are hyper-rational, so they don't trust their emotions at all. Some are very emotional. Uh, and so it's really about allowing them to, access well-being as the foundation of their peak performance it all starts with creating that space and that perspective once you've got that space you start to look at your thoughts you start to look at the emotions that arise when you have that those thoughts and then you look at the behavior that ensues right the actions they undertake the mindsets they have those create the results that they see in the world right mm -hmm. it's all it's all of the, the programs that's going on at a subconscious level. So a lot of my work is training them to start noticing their thoughts, start reframing their limiting beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure they have that spaciousness so that they can start to look at things and go, okay, is this serving me? Is it not serving me? Is this destroying my team? Is it uplifting my team? Is it building mm -hmm. my business or is it keeping me on this hamster wheel? Right. So it all starts with consciousness. And an awareness of how they show up and this belief that once they quieten down. So I, I actually work with the brain and, and it's really about switching off the part of the brain that sabotages them. And that sits at the back of your brain. And then it's allowing you to switch on that part, the prefrontal cortex, which is the brain part of the brain that serves you. So that is 
the part of your brain that is aware of itself, mm. that is creative, that is resourceful, that has compassion, that has empathy, that allows it to look at things and say, okay, if I'm to look, if I'm to look back at myself at the end of my life, you know, what would what sort of life would I want to live? What does success mean for me? What would be the most empowering steps for me to take? One of my favorite questions, which is perfect for your, your podcast, is what can I do today that is going to have 10 times the impact with half the effort? All of that comes from a different part of your brain. And you need space. Yeah. It comes from taking the time. You could call it meditation. You could call it awareness. I don't necessarily call it meditation to some clients who are hyper-rational. I teach them how to do it in a way that is takes 10 seconds I love that. where they can switch from one part of the brain to the next. And then the more they spend, the more time they spend in that part of their brain, the whole spiritual side, the more self-connection, the more self-trust, the more universal connection is open to them and they just get it. Hmm. I don't need to tell them. They start to access their own wisdom. They start showing up differently, creating new results. And then that becomes the template. Uh, and it doesn't just change that, it changes everything. That's what, uh, Terrence McKenna said that he's long past, but I think he said something like, you know, you need to click on your ag- amygdala, right? You need to click to the front. Click and, off and your amygdala. Sorry, so your click it amygdala off. is the one that's your panic. You know, there you go. Like, sorry. The, but the, um, yeah. what's the one? Cortex. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. Yes. Do you want me to show you how we can do this? Sure. Yes. All right. Okay. I want you to watch really, really, really carefully. Okay. Can you see my hands? Yes. yes. You ready? Okay. Watch. All right, stop. Okay, what happened as I was doing this? Did you have any thoughts? No. Or were you just keenly watching? I was watching. I I was was focusing on your hands. Totally. Right, and what was the quality of your mind space? It kind of settled down a little bit. Yeah. Was there any self-talk? No. No. Were you completely present and absorbed with the world around you, i.e. this conversation? Yes. It's that simple. That's how we use our body. So it could be the breath. We anchor into our breath for 10 seconds. Another technique, you rub your fingers so gently together that you're feeling the ridges of your finger finger pads. Or you could be feeling into your feet. Or you could be, you know, seeing something looking at the person in front of you and trying to see something you've never seen before. So you're tapping into your five senses. You're anchoring into your body to switch off your mind. So this is actually something, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of spiritual quests throughout my life. I've, I've, I've done all of the applied meditation and the Buddhist training and everything else. And about three years ago, I came across something called positive intelligence and it works for a C-suite across the world. It's taken the best of positive psychology, neuroscience, um, positive uh, positive sorry I'm going around in circles positive psychology and sports psychology and then they've put um, extra research on top to understand all the different ways that we get in our own way Hmm. right and they've distilled it down to 10 key attributes 10 key avatars if you like so those are our saboteurs you've got the judge who's the father the big saboteur that Mm -hmm. sort of pulls in all the other minions the controller the um, hyper achiever the hyper rational the avoider Hmm. Um, the perfectionist, there's a cast of 10 characters. They'll be yeah. very, very familiar. And the, the way that they talk to us in our brain stops us and shuts us down. It keeps us in fear and survival mode in the back of our brain. Mm. And so when we are able to move to our prefrontal cortex, they basically use that framework of 10 seconds. So using snackable um, attention, using your body. So hmm. your senses, your breath, whatever it is, to switch off your your survival brain, your saboteur brain, to access your prefrontal cortex. And when you're there, you have access to these superpowers. So this could be empathy, it could be innovation, could be the power of curiosity and exploration. And it's really about, okay, shift from one mindset or mind space to another, you know, on demand. And that's really powerful for people who, you know, I meditate I meditate, I could spend, you know, an hour meditating and then I could go out later on in the afternoon. My teenage daughter will be a pain in the backside and I will lose my rag. (laughs) And this is great. It's snackable. She she could be like, and all I need to do is just mm, do my PQ reps. We call them PQ reps. 
PQ stands for your positive intelligent quotient. So it's like you have your IQ or you have your EQ. This is your PQ and it's all about building your mental fitness. So I love it. So C-suite can do that in the middle of a confrontational meeting. They could do it if they've got, you know, no time during back-to-back meetings because they're guaranteed to go to the toilet or at least grab a coffee throughout the day. And they could just have small moments where they're feeling the water on their hands or smelling the coffee or doing something to just switch off. It's like an instant refresh. Those are beautiful tools. It's, it's yeah. Something everybody can apply. And yeah. I think one of the tricks though, as you were mentioning about your, your teenage daughter is when you, when you get hooked, it, sometimes it's hard to recognize that you've been hooked and, and you're just <laughs> reactive, right? Really? So it's, it's, it's being That's cognizant why it's... of those tools and being able to access them at those points. And, yeah. And it's not always easy. I mean, I'm, I'm still not a black belt on it. I lose my rag with her all the time. She's highly sort of a high oppositional disorder. So she's almost like my Buddha in some ways. She's, she's hey. brought to me that I can get a black belt in training. You, people that are, you need like a few stripes on that black belt because people that are close to you also, I mean, they're, you know, doing their own thing, but they recognize what you're trying to do and they better than anyone else know how to poke you in places that can get you right she's so a black a, belt yeah. <laughs> so it's not just yeah. a general i'm at work and you know it's like your closest people know your your secrets and they know where to get you so. yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and you know what i i firmly believe that i've called her into my life you know there's the she's not there by accident we've got a contract her and i her to be a big pain in the backside uh, you know before and after and beyond teenage years <laughs> just so that i can learn all of my own trigger points and work on them because she can poke me as much as she want to but it won't hurt unless there's a wound there that i react to you know so if i come up with are you disrespecting me interesting all right. What have I got oh, that's all about respect? Let's do some work on that. Mm. And honestly, I'm finding, you know, <laughs> never ending supply of, of triggers, which is, which is wonderful. That's crazy. Do yeah. You, um, this is kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of an abstract question, but do you feel like in your work that with the people that you're coming across, that it's, as you go through the years of doing this, that, that it's being more accepted, I guess, by, the, the folks that you're working at, at, at your level, hopefully I'm making sense, but I feel like with all of this, you know, remember, you know, how they used to talk about the age of Aquarius and that there was going to be this new wave and everybody's going to, you know, all of a sudden turn into spiritual beings and, and everybody's going to be nice to each other and all that stuff. But I also feel like the work that you're doing and, you know, people like some other people that are really kind of get those gurus out there and they charge a lot of money to do it. But, you know, kind of penetrating just out there on their own or in in teams, just penetrating and penetrating and doing the real everyday work, you know, um, is interesting to me. And I'm just wondering if you're feeling kind of more people being open to it in that sense. Yeah, I think definitely people are more open to it than uh, I would have anticipated before. Um, Having said that, there are still some leaders who are just very, very close to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they are, I kind of use that approach that I would do with, you know, hyper rationals where I talk about the science. So Mm -hmm. instead of manifestation, it's about uh, understanding that there are um, things happening beyond their level of consciousness that unless they plant an awareness to look for it, they won't see That's what manifestation is. You're actually asking your brain to spot things in the environment. So I try and put things that are are quite spiritual into more sort of scientific methods. And I actually really, really enjoy, you know, the whole idea of how spirituality uh, meets neuroscience or Mm -hmm. the various sciences so that I can actually help people take these highly spiritual um, propositions and put them into very commercial um, perspective. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I mean. We do that too. Yeah. Like we, we yeah. start to interrupt, but it, it, like, say if we're talking to, um, I don't know, we, we, we get into sales situations and a lot, you know, and the different personalities that we have to talk, we have to make adjustments and we have to be kind of finely tuned to be able to, you know, see where the other person is at and be able to take what we know and kind of translate it into not only what they can understand, but also what they're going to be receptive to. Right. You know, the, the, yeah the kind of computer thinking brain, 
when you're 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 not talking numbers and things like that, they don't you know um, they really want to know the data, and and you know you have to yeah. adjust in those things too. Um, yeah, but my, you know, my background is in sales as well and if you start to talk to them for example about um, non-verbal communication they'll get that right because salespeople should be able to walk into a room and read the energy they can read the non-verbal cues now try and put that into a sort of uh, a technical way you know as, as soon as you say you're going to read the energy you're going to read, read the non-verbal communication they'll get it right that's all spiritual stuff that's all sort of more on the more woo-woo side Right, mm-hmm. right, right. But what's neat is, is there's an agreement, there's an implicit agreement from the get go, because in order for you to start having these conversations and even get there, they have to recognize something in themselves that's like, I need help here. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So there's an, there's an agreement going on just to get them framed up within that sphere, you know? Yeah, absolutely. They have to be, there has to be a, a level of self-awareness some level of self-awareness for them to even put their hand up and say, I want this. They have to know what's amiss. It's not just about the opportunity. It's about this desire to shift into something better, you know, from where they're at. Yeah. Does the time it takes when you're working with a client to get them to see that and to shift and to have market self-growth and improvement, does it really vary run the spectrum? Like some people can tap into what they need to do relatively quickly and others it can take a while. Yeah, I think it depends on the individual. So, you know, the Buddhist in me will say it depends on their their karma, right? I have one client who had never meditated before and I started coaching with him because he couldn't access his emotions, mm. right? And so um, he did my applied med- my mindfulness course, which is on my YouTube channel now. It's all free. He did it, it was like four hours, one hour per session. And he just started, uh, you know, seeing amazing results just in terms of the whole way he, he he stilled his mind. He was going through like a whole seismic shift at his work. He had to leave the country that he was in, move his family across the world. Everything was in a state of shift. And he was just so calm and centered. He couldn't believe it. He got uh, the job that he wanted. He's now consulting. He's like, people think that I should be really stressed. You know, I'm doing such an amount of work, but I'm actually couldn't be more relaxed. Mm-hmm. And he's just the, the the level of growth that he's had just from this uh, awareness, self-awareness has just been utterly life-changing, Interesting. utterly life-changing for him. And he's, he's, you know, within a year or two, he's, he wrote a book that came from his dreams, which was his own way of sorting and sifting through his emotions. And now he's sort of publishing this book. Wow. Talk about creative side, yeah. I love it. You know, we were talking about flow a little while ago and, you know, how time can just fly fly by when you're in this state of flow and you're grooving on work or whatever it is you're doing. But are there techniques or words of advice on how to get into flow? Like sometimes you're just in it and you're flowing through it, but sometimes I don't even know, like, how how do you get into that state of flow? How do you get into that state of flow? So to me, flow isn't about acquiring anything. You don't need to learn anything to get into a state of flow. It's about letting go of stuff, right? So to get into that state of flow, you just need to be able to switch off your narrative mind. You need to be focused on whatever you're at. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, it's exercise beforehand, whatever you need to do to sort of calm that restless mind. For me, it would be meditate, focus on your breath, and then apply yourself into the work. If the work will really interest you, you'll be in flow. If it's engaging, you'll be in flow. And part of that is the mindset that you bring to that project. So for example, if there's a lot of resistance and a lot of talk, like, I don't want to be doing this, this is a pain, (laughs) you can create, you can create resistance, you know? Yeah. Uh, I bet there's a few people out there who are going, yeah, I want to be, I want to earn millions. I want to sit there and I want to earn millions. And then there's part of their brain that's going, I don't want to earn millions because it's going to destroy my family. And they've got all of these beliefs. So you've got one foot on the accelerator and the other one on the brake and they're spinning their wheels. All of this is chatter in the background. It's all of these things that are coming back and, and stopping us from actually getting into flow in our life, not just in our moment, but in our life. So it's really about spending the time watching your thoughts and then sort of not indulging in them, just noticing them, yeah. right? Huh. 
So, yeah, the other part of flow is just doing, doing it. And then just, um, I find I access it when I get into work, just I, I switch everything off. Yeah. When you get that engrossed in something, it just happens naturally. But a state of flow in your life generally comes from switching off all of the chatter and yeah. then being in that part of your brain that is focused and present. It's all about presence. But with respect to work, I, th I think, you know, at least for me, you make a good point, like, Sometimes I'll be working and it just the day flies by and then sometimes I'm doing something that I don't like doing and it's very it's it's drudgery right it's just plodding yeah. through it and it, it may maybe it's more of my mindset and I need to switch that mindset to flow through it. Yeah, or maybe you need to think about how you can outsource all the things that you really hate doing and focus on the things that give you energy. We talked about that right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had this weird experience. I don't generally have this, but uh, I ride the Peloton and um, not so much, but enough, you know, to kind of get to know the different, different, I guess they're teachers or coaches or whatever. But I threw one on just yesterday or the day before yesterday. And I literally watched myself from the outside. Usually I can get in and it's very good getting you into the flow, right? You can go and, and, and I love it for that, but this time, for some reason, I'm not going to name any names, but I really ended up, I found out that I really hated the person that was the coach. And just in that moment, what I was going through, you know, I guess she's fine or whatever. But like in that moment, I could not, like I was getting so annoyed by certain things and I could not get into the workout to the point where I was three quarters of the way through and I was so angry and I was angry at myself that I just didn't stop and get off the damn bike. But I knew I'm like, I got to finish this stupid thing. But it, like, so crazy how you can spin out of control. You know, it's so it, it was so weird to why because I don't normally get like that. But maybe something else was going on. And I didn't notice it. Because I use exercise to try to give myself some space sometimes or, or allow my body to say, Okay, let's break free for a minute. And let's just do something, you know, and kind of shake things up. And I couldn't, it was really weird. It was very, very strange. That's a great example of how your judge comes in, yeah. right? And starts judging that other coach, you know, oh, you're no good, blah, blah, blah. And then it starts <laughs> judging you. And the funny thing is you had anger, which is a really, really powerful energy that you could have used to just- I totally spin. could have. I you should know? have. Like, like yeah. those bills <laughs> and I should just, like, just grinded it out. But I- like I was so stuck on, so petty and so stuck on this thing. It was so weird, you know, it's very interesting. Was, was there an aspect of, of, of that person that really uh, made you angry? What was it that was your trigger? Oh, man, it was, um, I, I mean, it sounds just like a, just a punk, but you know, it, it, there was, there was man, I think it was mannerisms it was some of the mannerisms that were coming out that were really bothering me. And then, and then I didn't feel like she was, she was, I didn't feel like the, the, <laughs> so stupid. I didn't feel like the, um, you know, you have to kind of make adjustments in order to change the intensity. And I didn't feel like she was kind of doing the intensity according to where we needed to go. She was just going off mm -hmm. on some whole other thing and I couldn't keep up. So maybe it was all about me. You know, what I mean? Zach knows what I'm talking about. Well, you know what I hate is on these pelotons <laughs> when they don't do the workout, like they stop and they're just talking. Right. You need to work out. And then I'm she started out. singing to, to the out. songs. She started <laughs> singing to the songs. And like then my wife came in and she's like, what the heck? You know, like it just turned into this whole thing. It was very, very, very interesting. Mm. Oh, she was so the singing? coach wasn't oh, wasn't present was. with you. <laughs> <laughs> what's that Georgina <laughs> so the coach wasn't present with you no they weren't I, no. where you were actually I had the thought though and that's a really good point like in the middle of it I had the thought that that because they were they're in like this COVID I took I chose a class that was like you know like six months ago and so they don't have anybody in their studios and they just started bringing people back and I was imagining if her if she'd be more connected, if people were actually there riding with her, like a normal spin class, right? Because 
like you say, if you were there and engage in everything, you attune yourself to what's going on with the people around you. And maybe some of the stuff that I was getting angry at, she wouldn't do in a group setting. Mm. I don't know. I love that much more compassionate perspective. (laughs) (laughs) God, but you know, that was like the petty, that, you know, a petty judge was coming out being just a little punk. It was crazy. Yeah. And I'm 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 going to be careful not to put my coaching hat on right no, now. It's no, no, really no, no, no. It had nothing to do with that. I think it's more. It was probably ninety percent me. You know what I mean? In in that moment and what I was doing. That's really. But that's real. You know, that's relevant to this. You know mm. what I mean? And and the other thing that really I really brought it really brought to mind too is. You know, there's no there's no. I've heard it said that there's no degree in all of this, right? you are always where you are and some things you, you kind of integrate and you become a little bit better at letting go, as you say, but for the most part, you don't just get it. And all of a sudden that you you don't have to worry about it anymore. Right. Like, like there's always going to be things because it, you know, it's infinite. The, the, um, our environment is kind of infinite and, and we're, these incredibly, you know, um, finely tuned kind of reception beings in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah, beautifully put, beautifully put. And in fact, that there are some things, I mean, I work a lot in triggers where you can actually dissolve them, you experience them, you understand them and you dissolve them, but it's like peeling back, uh, you know, the onion. There's just always more layers. There's always going to be more tears. You know, until you get to the essence of who you are, and that might not happen in this lifetime, you'll get closer and closer, happier and more in flow. Right. Yeah. 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 My jujitsu teacher, you know, would talk about his master and that's what they say, right? You like our whole goal when we first starting out is get a black belt, like we were talking about before, you know, but his master would always say, you know, that, that black belt, the, the belt is just to hold up your pants. (laughs) <laughs> Meaning there is no black belt. Like he, they, he would wear a white belt on the mats and he was like, you know, this master, like, you know, and, um, and it's so true. Like it never ends. And like, you, that's such a great way of talking about it, about peeling back the onion and learning about yourself. And, and there's always more layers always, you know, I wish my sensei had that, uh, that wisdom. I, I'm a brown belt in karate. Um, mm-hmm. We did it with my family in Singapore for four years, right. but it was really only about fighting. Right. <laughs> there was no none of the insight. I had to go externally for that. Right. I love that. Are you still really are you still practicing your karate? No, um, we haven't found a good uh, dojo near where we live, but um, we have a, a tumble dryer in the garage and my husband's put up a punch bag in there. So every time I go <laughs> oh, out, okay. I get to sort of punch and kick and just let out some of that energy, which is really good. And yeah. also try and keep warm because, you know, I'm, I'm used to the tropics now. I'm moving back to England. It's cold. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you at right now? Are, are you uh, um, back in East Asia still or where are you? I'm in the UK now. So I live in Warwickshire, which is sort of central, central mm-hmm. UK. Right on. Central England. So you mentioned that you had some courses. Talk to us just a little bit about, um, you said you had some free courses on YouTube. Is that how you're kind of promoting a lot of the self-study stuff that you do? Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of workshops and the workshops I, I just post on my YouTube channel as, you know, value for people who can who can use it. So some of that might be my mindfulness um, for, for beginners course. Some of it is the stuff on the saboteurs and the mental fitness. Some of it is on stepping into confidence for NLP. I love playing and using different things. So the more workshops I do, the more I put it on, on my YouTube channel and on my website. Okay. So um, I, I offer those for, for free. Um, I also um, offer group coaching courses and I have one that's four months long, three weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, one week off. And uh, it's called From Survive to Thrive. And it's really about overcoming self-doubt and stepping into your full potential. And you do that by, I mean, it's a five-step process that I call arise. So A is awareness, you Mm -hmm. know, awareness of our own thoughts, right? And the behaviors and, and everything else, that space to actually introspect. And um, the next one is realign. The R in arises realigning and reframing our limiting beliefs. I is setting our intentions. What do we want? 
professionally, personally. S is the strategy, so how to get there. And then E is embody so that you don't just go out from the group coaching course and go, wow, this is amazing. My life is changing. And then <clears throat> off it goes. Yeah, right. you know, you're able to embody it into your life. Right. Um, and that's that's just been an incredibly fulfilling uh, program because the people who go through it just start uh, quite closed, sort of lacking confidence. And by the end of it, they're, they're whole lives have shifted they're showing up in the world completely differently they're they're accessing new jobs their relationships are working you know it's it's astonishing um so that's that's the program that i tend to run i also send people on this positive intelligence course the saboteurs the mental fitness thing and Mm. that's a six week it's like a boot camp Mm. and we do that through the positive intelligence program so we use a mobile app this this is the same one that c-suites all over the world have used across 50 different countries and um it trains your mind by checking in throughout the day um, and giving tasks and giving challenges. And at the end of the six weeks, the idea is that if you put under an MRI, you'll see atrophy in the back of your brain and growth in your prefrontal cortex. Yeah, it's here, quite really? amazing. It's totally. That's come incredible. and do it. Wow. Would you like to do it? I'll send yeah, you guys on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's that's a remarkable um, because it's 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 rapid and and anyone can do it. So it's completely secular. You don't have to believe in all the spirituality or the woo woo stuff. You could go in as a, a, a team. So it's it's great for businesses, especially when you start to talk about sales people right so you're in saboteur mode and then other people are saboteur mode and they're just clashing whereas if you turn up in sage which is accessing that part of your brain the prefrontal cortex then you're able to shift everything around you by not reacting or not responding to that though are the other saboteurs but also thinking in an elevated way so that you're able to see opportunities or read the room better so that yeah you show up differently you, huh. you create new results. And then other than that, the rest of that I do is just one-on-one coaching. So that's that's my my career and what I do in a nutshell. That's fantastic. What, what is your website for our listeners? It's georginahallaby.com. Yeah, great. Definitely yeah. go there, guys, and go find her on YouTube as well because exactly. this all sounds fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I want to offer as well. I, I offer a free 90-minute discovery call for anyone who actually wants to try out coaching or who wants to try out coaching with me. So it's not salesy at all. The idea is we spend the first part looking into what's getting in your way right now and understanding all of the uh, the beliefs that are driving that. And then the second half is where you want to get to. And, you know, what are the actions and the mindsets and the beliefs that will get you there? And, you know, at the end of it, if you feel complete, brilliant. If you want to explore what it could look like to coach with me, brilliant. It's just really a case to connect and to explore and see if there's a fit. So and can they get to the can they get to the discovery call on your website or do you have a separate page for that? It's all on the website. They can book in a discovery call. It's 90 minutes. Yeah, perfect. That's fantastic. And if you if you both fancy it, Mark and Zach. Yeah. You, Discovery you call with me. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic, very enlightening. And, and you know, it t- it, for me, I don't know about you, Zach, but for me, it touched, you know, upon a lot of stuff that um, I'm really actively trying to integrate. Yeah. You know, because I'm, I've kind of integrated two parts of my lives, you know, into this business, um, you know, this business side. So um, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Do you really find that they're, that they're disconnected or are they connected? I think that it's all in my mind, but I also think that, um, you know, I, I come from a, I'm a performer, right. A long time kind of professional uh, actor. And so the struggle that I've had, you know, and I'm, st- I'm still coming to it is really kind of bringing, bringing the two kind of things together. There's a business side to what I've done for many years. Um, but really entrepreneurial and very out there on the bleeding edge and less kind of institutional. Whereas what we're doing now, we come into contact less, a little bit less bleeding edge, but at the higher echelons coming into contact with real institutional corporate types, you know, that, um, Mm. you know, yeah, they're two completely different worlds in my opinion. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I am very familiar with that duality and the tension that it creates you know, and, and, and the ability to show up fully in both worlds, nice. seamlessly in both worlds. Yeah. Nice. yeah amazing. Yeah. Well, this has been really great, Georgina. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Georgina. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Zach and Mark. 10X for Gen XYZ is hosted by Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios. 
co-founders of Prosperity CRE, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and building long-term wealth. If you like the podcast, please give us a positive rating and subscribe to be notified about future content. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our approach to real estate investing, you can download a free copy of our real estate investment book, Investing for Cashflow and Long-Term Wealth, by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thank you and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes.